Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our Irvine Homebuyer Workshop. My name is Jason Maida. It's great to be with you this evening. I uh, hope you guys have had a great week so far. I know it's a busy holiday season, so uh, you know, kudos to everyone taking time out of their busy you know, shopping schedule, work schedule to join us for tonight's class. Um, just quick logistics on tonight's uh, workshop. So we're going to go run about 60 minutes in, in total time for tonight's class. Um, this is an interactive session, so I always encourage questions as we roll through to, through uh, tonight's content. So um, we'll answer some of those questions on air. Feel free to use the uh, Q&A or chat function within Zoom, and then I'll basically answer some of those questions on air. Um, Many of you tonight are hearing about uh, our class because of our partnership with UC Irvine alumni. We're really excited about that. We've been in partnership with UCI going on the last, what, four or five years, and, and we've got a chance to you know, teach hundreds of uh, future home buyers uh, this content that you're going to hear this evening. So um, thanks again for joining us. Um, let's go ahead and get started. And I was going to allow a few people to get them into the room, but it looks like we're ready to go. Um, just a quick a little bit about me. Uh, again, my name is Jason Maida. I'm the branch manager here with American Pacific Mortgage. Uh, we're based out of Northern California, but we service multiple states, including all of California, right from our offices here in Sacramento. Um, we specialize in mortgage lending, more specifically first-time homebuyer programs. And so you're going to learn a little bit about that this evening. There's a lot of cool stuff that's coming in the next year with um, our partnership with CalHFA, which is the California Housing Finance Agency. So you're going to learn a little bit about that tonight. We'll also talk about some of the kind of the core programs when it comes to uh, financing options for you for your home purchase. Here's some of our talking points tonight. So we're going to look at the housing market today. We're also going to spend some time looking at interest rates, um, uh, you know, how that's impacting qualifying and purchasing power for our clients. We're going to do a buy versus rent analysis in just a few minutes. Also talk about credit, some student loans and how, you know, kind of the pending legislation with student loan reduction of debt, how that can help you uh, and how we look at calculations for student loans for buyers. Uh, we're also going to look at those loan programs. So FHA, conventional loans, VA loans. Uh, we're going to take a look at all the different products that are available to you as a first-time buyer or even a second or third-time buyer. Uh, and then we'll spend just a brief amount of time looking at the documentation typically needed for uh, being eligible for your home purchase. Also look at assistance programs. So there's some fantastic first-time home buyer programs that are available to you and, and great resources. And then finally, we'll wrap up tonight's discussion looking at the process of buying a house. So if I'm kind of finishing tonight's class and just trying to figure out where do I go from here and how do I start the process, we're going to walk you through the six steps of home buying to go from actually getting pre-approved for your financing to get to the very end of the stage where you actually get the keys to your house. So we'll kind of go through all that stuff this evening. Um, so we're going to kind of launch into tonight's class. First of all, talking about home buying at from, you know, does it make sense for me financially? Because this is probably going to be one of the biggest investments you make in your lifetime. So, you know, or at least in your near term financial future. So, you know, many of you are probably setting goals for 2023. You know, what do I want to accomplish this year? Maybe some health goals, maybe relationship goals, business goals, but certainly financial goals comes with it as well. So maybe home buying is in your future in 2023. And I think there's some really cool opportunities that exist in today's market, um, you know, with kind of some of the corrections we're seeing uh, with the housing market. And this is going to be, like I said, one of the biggest purchases you make. So you're taking time out of your busy schedules to kind of learn a more, little bit more about it. With home buying comes some really incredible benefits. Um, first of all, you create more of a kind of a solid budget for yourself. So you're not, you're not relying upon a landlord that's, you know, increasing your rent every time you maybe renew your lease. Um, you're, you know, having you know, the opportunity to see your home grow in, in in equity, which basically means your home goes up higher in value versus what you owe on it. That difference is called home appreciation or equity. Um, this is an asset that you can pass along to the heirs of your estate. So as this thing grows in equity, that's the ability to be able to pass along to other family members. And there's some great tax benefits that still come along with home buying. So you can still potentially deduct interest uh, through your, your mortgage. So when we look at how do we kind of start with figuring out is home buying the right place for me? I think kind of doing a budget analysis is a, is a, is a good place to start. And so we always open up our classes doing a rent versus buying calculator. And so I'm going to walk you guys through a few examples, or just one example, I should say. And um, we're going to send all these tools and resources to you tomorrow morning. So after we wrap up tonight's class, all of our presentation material is going to be available to you online, including this calculator. So you can get a chance to do your own 
kind of, uh, you know, assessment of what your budget could look like. But I want to kind of give you an example just to see how we walk through it. So um, let's start off by just doing this analysis. And we're going to plug in, first of all, the rent scenario. So we'll say this is what it looks like today if I was renting. Here's what it could look like if I was going to purchase. And then we'll kind of draw a side-by-side -side comparison with those two different paths. Um, so let's assume we're going to rent at like 3200 a month, okay? And I know it could be more or less depending on where we where we currently reside. Um, we're going to factor in uh, monthly renter's insurance of about $15 a month. Um, we're going to also assume rent's going to increase about 3% every year as I renew my lease. And then on the purchase side, we're going to assume a purchase price of $650,000. The minimum down payment at this purchase price is 3%. OK, we're going to talk a little bit about the conforming loan limits in just a bit, I, you know, in case you guys are paying close attention to what the loan limits are for Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac and FHA. We're going to talk about those in just a minute, but those have escalated quite a bit uh, going into 2023. So this 650 amount is going to be what we call the it's going to be within the conforming limits. Um, so that minimum down payment is three percent. We're going to assume property taxes is 7250 on an annual basis. Usually you'll pay um, a portion of those every month as part of your monthly mortgage and payment, especially if you put less than 10% down. You'll have homeowners insurance that we'll factor in, and we're also going to add in maintenance costs. Okay. Um, and then under loan information, we'll just open that tab. We're going to assume a 30-year mortgage. 6.125 is the rate. Um, I think the last class I taught for our UCI team was probably closer to 7%. So good news on the interest rate front. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. Um, origination charges, that's what your lender could charge you in terms of cost. Now, as being a part of our UCI alum, uh, there's a great discount program. We're going to talk more about that later on, but it basically helps you reduce your cost by $750 with your UCI membership. Um, and then the next section is called discount points. And that allows you as a buyer to basically bring down your interest rate by paying additional costs. Usually one discount point is the equivalent of 1% of your loan amount. So if I want to try to bring down my rate slightly, let's say I pay 1% discount points, generally that's going to lower the, my interest rate about 0.25%. So instead of a 6.125% loan, maybe I'm looking at a 5.875% loan. And then the other settlement charges will be like other closing costs, title, escrow fees, government, uh, government fees like transfer taxes, recording costs. I would always recommend first-time buyers, especially factor about two to three percent of your sales price for closing costs. And then the last section is other assumptions. So we're going to assume that our home is going to go up over, we'll say three uh, percent appreciation, and assuming that we're going to be in the house for seven years, uh, we have the selling costs of our home. So as a buyer, you're not responsible to pay for commissions to the realtor that helped represent you. But when you turn around and sell your property in the future, then you will have to pay realtor commissions to the buyer's agent that represents the buyer that comes to your home and purchases it, as well as to the uh, selling agent that, that sells your property for you. But as a buyer, you don't have to worry about this. As we kind of forecast what this could be in seven years, we want to put those selling costs in here. And we're going to estimate around 9%. We have the state and federal tax rate, and then we also have a savings rate. So what this calculator does is it takes our total cost of renting. So if we're going to continue to rent for $3,200 a month versus our mortgage payment, uh, which our mortgage payment in this in this scenario is about $5,200 $5, a month. So it's a little bit higher. Um, but when we look at the total cost versus the total uh, total cost of renting versus buying, it's about a $65,000 uh, difference in, in terms of buying. Because when I factor in my tax benefits, as well as appreciation over seven years, that creates that $65,000 opportunity. Now, when we think about it from a monthly budget standpoint, you know, we're looking at going up about $2,600 a month in overall costs. So there's going to be some trade-off there. So that's where as a buyer, we're going to have to figure out, does this home buying really make sense for me when I kind of put the whole calculation together? Okay, so we had a couple of questions that came in. Um, so first question was, could you please explain the cost of points and how much they bring down interest rates again? So it depends on the structure of your loan, but generally 1% of your loan amount, uh, which is one point, will generally bring down the, the interest rate about qu a quarter percent. So 0.25%. So 1% cost. So if I'm financing $500,000, that's $5,000 in a cost, usually translates to a quarter percent reduction in interest rate. 
And then we had another question was with respect to the recent increase to the conforming loan limit, uh, if the loan is finalized this year, it can still be done through jumbo route. Cor correct. Um, so um, right now we have the conforming limits in place. Um, so we would, we would adhere to conforming limits um, and, you know, given the time period right now, um, you know, it would, because uh, we only have a couple of weeks left in the year, more than likely be going with the conforming limit. Okay, we're going to talk a little bit about the high balance limit, which goes beyond the conforming limit a little bit later in tonight's workshop. Okay, so we'll talk more about that in just a bit. Um, all right, so that's our that's our rent versus buying calculator. Let me go ahead and get us back into our, our slideshow here. Um, and I did not transition that right. So give me one minute. Okay, let me, sorry about that, guys. We got to maneuver through this. Okay, all right. Let's go ahead now. We're going to transition into kind of looking at the housing market. So now we've learned a little bit about our budget. Now I want to kind of talk a little bit about the housing market. As probably most of you know, the housing market has changed quite a bit, especially over the last six months, driven behind what's going on with interest rates. So this slide kind of depicts what we've seen with median home prices in the area. Median home prices dropped. Um, pretty significantly. And what you're seeing right now is you're seeing the increase of homes on the market or the time at which a home is on the market. So you're seeing median days on market going up uh, to 54 days, which, you know, in, you know, six months ago, or maybe even a year ago, we saw that number probably closer to 30, 30 days or less on market. Um, so we're starting to see some normalized market. Um, now we still need more inventory out there. But, you know, I think as we're looking at the market, from an opportunistic perspective, I think for first time home buyers, now is a great time to get in. Now we know rates are not at the same level we had, you know, a year and a half ago at the 3% level, but the trade-off is we're seeing a less competitive market. We're seeing home prices that, that have dropped. Um, and that, that drop depends on where you're looking to purchase um, by city. But ultimately I think there's a, a, an incredible opportunity in the market. Now, you know, as we look at our economic climate and the talks of are we going into recession, what does that look like? Um, if we go into recession, we probably will see even lower rate interest rate environment, which we're going to talk about in just a minute. But we'll also probably see more people transition into the housing market, which is going to create more competition, possibly level out our prices or maybe start to push that prices back up again. So we'll have to kind of monitor things to see how it goes. But I think ultimately, especially in this next quarter of 2023, I think that presents a really great opportunity for first time buyers. Um, now, as we're looking at interest rates, as I mentioned earlier, the last six months of interest rate climbs have really impacted the housing market. So especially our move up buyers, so buyers that are looking to buy second and third type homes have really kind of gone, gone back and maybe parked it on the sidelines a bit just because of where interest rates have gone. So we saw interest rates crest over 7%. That changes affordability. It changes the the kind of the the purchasing power desire to kind of take that next step. We saw first time home buyers, uh, first time home ownership slow down just a little bit because obviously it changed the budgets for a lot of our first time buyers. But the good news now is we are starting to see that rates have come back down. So I think we've kind of reached the peak of what we'll see in interest rates. Um, average interest rates have now dropped into the low sixes. It does change day by day. We're still really watching what's going on with inflation because the Federal Reserve is trying to get a handle on inflation and rates recently dropped um, about quarter percent in the last week because the consumer price index showed inflation had calmed. And so now we're seeing kind of rates start to settle down because of you know inflation hopefully becoming under control. But I think the next question is, you know, when does the Federal Reserve start to slow down? the frequency of, of this interest rate hikes. Um, uh, Federal uh, Chair Powell um, had the, the meeting minutes or spoke today after the meeting, uh, Federal Reserve meeting, did indicate, you know, they're, they're still taking a hard stance of make sure, making sure con uh, inflation is controlled. And, you know, the, he still left some kind of room for interpretation as to, you know, what it's going to look like in the future for uh, interest rate hikes. Um, but what I will say is, you know, from the mortgage perspective, we are starting to see interest rates, you know, come down to more acceptable levels. I think as we crested beyond 7%, it really made it difficult to help some of our buyers. But as we get into 6% and maybe possibly in the high fives, that's going to make it a much more appealing uh, budget number for our, our future home buyers. Now, when we look at interest rates, uh, not all interest rates are the same. Um, it's going to be based upon credit eligibility. So, 
based upon where you're at from a credit per score perspective, that will change the interest rate offering. Usually on a conforming loan, if you're at a 740 credit score or higher, you're going to get the best available interest rates. Um, the loan products will change the interest rate offering. So whether it's an FHA or a conventional loan, that could change things. Loan amounts will, will provide different varying interest rates. Um, down payment, if I'm putting 3% down versus 20% down, that can change and then we've talked a little bit about discount points earlier, which is the ability to be able to buy down your interest rate can also create interest rate reduction. And finally, the term of your loan. So um, if I take a 30-year fixed loan versus a 15-year fixed rate loan, that could change my interest rate offering. Usually the shorter term you take, the lower interest rate you're going to have. Okay, any questions on the market, uh, like the housing market, interest rates? Um, you know, I think, you know, a lot of, a lot of folks would like us to forecast where interest rates are going to go. We're not quite sure yet at this point, because there's just so many variables out there, but I think if we can see some level settling in the low sixes to high fives, I think that'll obviously be a much more appealing market for our buyers. Okay. All right. So if you have any questions do pop up, obviously feel free to use the, uh, the, the Q and a function here. I want to talk a little bit about credit because as we're preparing to buy, you know, having our credit in the best possible position is, is essential. Um, every product that's offered has different credit score minimums. So FHA loans are a 580 score. Conventional is 620. VA is a 620 score. And then for the first time homebuyer assistance program, it's a minimum of 640 for an FHA loan, 680 for a conventional loan. Um, when we look at the FICO score weighting uh, and how that's calculated, 15% of the FICO score is how long I've had credit. Um, so the longer, more mature my credit file is, the higher my credit score is potentially going to be. 20% is going to be how long I've had credit in, uh, or sorry, how much credit I have in use, like recent accounts that I've opened up. But more importantly, it's going to be around inquiries especially hard inquiries. So you really want to limit the number of hard inquiries you have. Now, as we start our process, so if you do decide you want to get pre-approved after tonight's class and you want to kind of look at different options, we only start with a soft credit score just to kind of understand where you're at financially and help design a home buying plan. So we try to make that a little more helpful for you. Now, if you do elect to do a hard inquiry with us or any other lender at some point, you do have a 30-day window of time to um, basically shop around with as many lenders as you want. And as long as those inquiries are done in that 30-day window, it's the equivalent of one credit inquiry hit to your score. The next component or weighting for the FICO score is, is the amount owed. That's also known as credit utilization. And what we're looking at is revolving accounts. So if we take a credit limit of, let's say, $10,000 and I have a $5,000 balance, I'm at 50% utilization, right? Ideally, I want to try to get my utilization below 10%. Um, if I'm, you know, hovering around that 70 to 80% level, we want to try to bring that down below 50% to help get that improvement in our credit score. The last section is going to be payment history, and that's going to obviously be how I paid my bills. So usually if I've had some past challenges like late payments, um, they're going to be rated in 30 day late, 60 day late, and then 90 plus delinquencies. Obviously, the higher the level of delinquency, the more impact it is going to be to your credit score. Um, let me take a quick step back. I want to talk again about utilization um, because utilization is probably one of the biggest areas of opportunity for first time buyers as you're kind of managing credit card accounts. Um, quick tip on how to manage utilization. Uh, and that is when you look at your credit card accounts, you have a billing statement date and you also have a due date. Many of us will pay, pay off or pay down our accounts on the due date. But when the credit card issuer sends data out to the credit agencies, they always go off the billing cycle date. So my tip for us tonight in, in the class is to try to pay down or pay off your credit cards before the billing cycle date. Because if I can reduce that amount of debt, then I'm going to have a lower amount of utilization and therefore my credit score should be much higher. Okay, so that's a great way of managing your uh, your credit card debt. Ideally, obviously, we like to have those paid to zero. Um but you know that's that's not always feasible for everyone. But I think ideally, if we can keep them below 10% utilization, that's going to be much more favorable for your credit score. Okay, um, account closure can sometimes impact sometimes impact your credit score. So if I'm in the habit of maybe doing a balance transfer um, and switching over to a different credit card issuer because they have better benefits or perks, whatever the case may be, um, you just want to be careful that you don't close out that previous credit card because when you close out that a card. It actually pulls away all the great history that you've had, whether it's payment history, high credit limit, 
all of our mature, more mature uh, account, those, all those things can, can potentially lower your score. So you want to be mindful of that uh, before you decide to close out that previous card. Um, now, as lenders, when we look at your credit score, we're going to look at all three credit agencies. So we look at Experian, Equifax, and TransUnion. And we take the middle score of those three credit scores. So if I'm at a 760 is my highest score, 740 is my middle, and then 720 is my lowest, 740 is what we're going to use um, when we assess kind of the qualifying. So the 740 credit score. Now, if I'm applying with a spouse and my spouse's score is you know 740, 720, and 700, their middle score is a 720. So it's lower than my 740 score. So we would actually take the 720 score when it comes to qualifying for a mortgage. Now, whether I'm at a 740 or 720 score is not going to change probably my qualifying, but what it will change is my potential interest rate offering, as well as the cost of mortgage insurance. Now, when we look at potentially like negative items that can stay on our credit report, this matrix kind of shows you how long those items would stay on your credit report. So those hard inquiries will be on your credit report for two years. Um, now, um, typically the, the inquiries you've had in the last six to 12 months are going to be the most impactful to your score. Um, late payments, collections will be on your uh, credit report for seven years. Again, if it's if a collection shows up in the last 12 to 24 months of us pulling your credit score, that's probably where it's going to be most impactful to your, your credit rating. And then bankruptcies, which are federal or, or sorry, um, public records will be on your credit report for 10 years or less. And then federal student loan debt or like tax liens generally will be on the credit report indefinitely. So let's talk a little bit about student loans. Um, and, you know, most of us do have student loan debt, and it's just a rea reality of qualifying uh, for mortgages that we'll have to take a look at it. You know, I do know, you know, there's pending legislation for forgiveness in, in student loans, and that's fantastic. Um, so hopefully we'll see some reduced balances for some of our future home buyers. But at the same time, we do have to take a look at the student loan debt when it comes to qualifying for a mortgage. Now, whether you're in school and you're on a deferment or um, you're on a forbearance because of the CARES Act as part of the pandemic, which all federal student loans are at this time, we still have to count a minimum uh, payment when it comes to qualifying. Um, now, if you're on an income-based repayment amount um, and that was your income-based repayment amount prior to the start of the pandemic, we can use that amount for qualifying. So let's say I have $75,000 worth of debt and my payment was $250 a month um, prior to the pandemic, and I can document that, then that $250 is what we're going to use for the qualifying. Now, if your student loans came due during the pandemic, or maybe you graduated, I should say, during the pandemic, and you don't have an income-based repayment amount set up, we'd have to either have one set up, or if you're applying for a conventional loan, the default payment would be 1% which would be $750 a month. So that could change the qualifying. If you're looking at an FHA loan, it's going to be 0.5% of the outstanding balance. Um, so those are kind of different approaches that we'll take as lenders to see you know, what, what's going to be the qualifying payment. The most favorable generally is going to be the income-based repayment amount. Um, now, if you have a zero payment, um, because that's what you've always been on in your income-based repayment, then that's the amount we can use. Usually every year you have to do an income certification uh, to see if you can stay at whatever payment level you're at. But um, those things are those are things we'll take into consideration when it comes to your qualifying. Okay, um, I'm going to backtrack a little bit. We had a question that came in. What about uh, just a question in general about collections? What happens when you pay off a collection? So Collections are a little tricky. In fact, I was talking to a client about this earlier this afternoon. So collections, when you pay them off, will not improve your credit score unless you have the collection account deleted from your credit file. So if I have a $100 collection from Comcast and it's been on my credit report forever and I decide to pay it off to zero balance and it shows paid, that will not change my credit score. But if I pay it off and I negotiate with Comcast to have it deleted, then I could potentially get a lift in my credit score. Same thing holds true with charge-offs. Um, actually, I shouldn't say that. Charge-offs, um, which basically means a lender has taken a loss on that particular account. Um, if you can get a charge-off paid off, generally that will give you improvements. You don't necessarily have to show that it's been deleted. Okay. Another credit score, uh, sorry, credit question came in. Uh, does paying off a loan improve one's credit score or does it decrease since there is no, uh, now less credit in the mix? 
Um, so if you pay off installment debt, it's usually kind of a, a, a neutral position. Sometimes I've seen if you pay off an auto loan, sometimes it'll like in the first 30 days, it'll give you a little bit of a reduction in score, um, but it shouldn't really have much of an impact. I think, you know, what I've found in looking at thousands of credit reports um, is really it's, we're centered more around revolving debt, right? Okay, great questions, guys. All right, yeah, keep the questions coming. Love to answer those on air for, for our class. Um, let's talk a little bit about loan programs. Um, these are the five core loan programs that are offered um, in general. And, you know, most of our first time buyers are going to be looking at conventional loans and FHA loans. Um, but we do have clients that, you know, at times are looking at jumbo loans, the USDA loan, which is going to be designed to help some of our rural areas and some of our desert communities are qualified under the USDA. USDA is a 0% down product. It does have income limitations. Um, USDA stands for the U United States Department of Agriculture. So it's in, it designed to help and invest in like lessly populated areas. And of course, our VA loans are going to be for our veterans that have served. If you have eligibility for the veterans loan, fantastic product. It's a zero down uh, payment option and there is no mortgage insurance on a VA loan. Okay, uh, we had a question about PMI. Um, the question on PMI, we actually have a full full section on PMI, so we'll get that and get to that in just a second. Um, and then another question came in: Is the closing cost different for a conforming and jumbo loan? Generally, the closing costs are going to be the same for both for all products. There's no difference in in what we see in closing costs. We'll talk a little bit more about that when we go through some scenarios in tonight's discussion. Um, and then your next question came in about a reserve requirement. So just hang tight on that one. We're going to talk about reserves in just a minute. Um, so again, the USDA loan is going to be, uh, or sorry, the veterans loan is going to be for a no down payment option for our veterans that have served. Now with VA loans, there is a VA funding fee. So if you're a first time user of the VA product, usually there's a 2.5% funding fee. Okay. Um, now a question came in about jumbo loans, and I'm just going to actually kind of share with you a little bit more about characteristics of jumbo loans. So when we finance more than a million eighty nine three hundred, and that's actually, um, that's got a new uh, high balance loan limit for uh, Orange County. We get into the jumbo loan space and those minimum down payments are usually 10 to 15% down. Um, and with jumbo loans, it's not typical for a first time home buyer to utilize that product, but it does happen at times. Um, and most of our jumbo clients are putting roughly 20% down. Um, but now with the new conforming limit changes, that, that may change quite a bit, especially in our high cost of living areas like LA, Orange County, the Bay Area markets. Um, as you can see here on the slide, there is reserve requirements for jumbo loans. Um, most jumbo loans have a 12-month reserve requirement, which is usually 12 months the equivalent of your monthly payment. So if you have a $7,000 mortgage payment, 7,000 times 12 is 84,000. So in reserves, you would need 84,000 plus your down payment and closing costs. Okay, so sometimes that can be a little bit of a challenge some of our, for some of our first-time buyers. Um, and some jumbo loans will have add-ons add for, like if you're a first-time buyer, the reserve requirement might even be a little bit higher. And those are kind of, um, those will change based upon um, the type of product that we're looking at within the jumbo space. Now, I want to spend most of our time tonight, though, talking about the conventional and FHA loans and kind of how what those look like. Um, and so when we look at, the conventional loan, the minimum down payment is 3% for a conventional loan up to the new conforming limit, which is 726200 Now, once we get beyond 726200 all the way up to a million eighty nine three hundred, which is a, a much larger number that we've seen over the last five years, the minimum down payment is 5%. Okay. So that space between 726200 and a million eighty nine is called high balance. And really designed to help our high cost of living markets like Orange County and help home buyers be able to afford a home with a lesser down payment. Um, and then FHA loans are going to be a minimum down payment of three and a half percent all the way up to a million eighty nine three hundred. Now, I will have to say, if you are joining us from some of the other counties like Riverside County, San Bernardino, maybe you're up in the Valley of California, the conforming or not the conforming limits, but the loan limits in general will change by county. Um, so in the valleys, we can go up to 726, 200, but the outlying areas like San Bernardino or Riverside County are not going to have those high balance limits. It'll just go up to the 726, 200 mark. When we think about conventional loans, those are going to be Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac loans. And like we said earlier, there's a minimum credit score of 620 for the conventional loan. FHA loan is going to be a minimum credit score of 580. 
Okay, one, we had a quick question that came in. Um, so we had a question came in about, would you suggest using credit unions as an alternative to loan options presented on this slide? I think, you know, everybody's situation is a little bit different. Um, credit unions may be an alternative, but credit unions will also have a much smaller uh, window uh, from a qualifying perspective. Um, but everybody's situation is a little bit different. So I would encourage you to look at all your different options when it comes to looking at financing. Okay. All right. So we had a question about PMI, and I'm, I'm glad that came up because we actually do a full slide on this in our, in our classes because it's a big part of home buying and understanding it's really important. As we learned earlier, the minimum down payment is 3%. And um, when you're putting 3% down, of course, that's going to put you in a, a mortgage insurance situation. PMI comes into play when we put less than 20% down. Okay. Now, PMI has different ways of making payments on that. There's a monthly MI option. There's a split MI where I pay some of it monthly. I can pay some of it upfront. There's a single premium. And what I do in that scenario is I actually basically just pay the full cost of the mortgage insurance at closing. And then there's the lender paid mortgage insurance, which really doesn't happen a lot. I honestly don't talk about the option too much because what it does is it elevates the interest rate for the client to buy out the mortgage insurance. The most common option is going to be the monthly mortgage insurance option. And what we do with that scenario is the monthly mortgage insurance is a line item in your monthly payment. So when we look at your monthly payment, there's principal and interest, there's property taxes, homeowners insurance, and then we'll have a line item for mortgage insurance. Now, mortgage insurance isn't the same for all clients. It does vary by the type of product, but more importantly, by your credit score what your down payment is, and then how much you finance. So the higher my down payment is, the higher my credit score, the lower my mortgage insurance costs will be. Now, there is a cancellation option generally with conventional loans, and that cancellation option says that if I have two years in my mortgage and then I have 20 to 22% equity in my home, I could potentially cancel my mortgage insurance. And that's a big feature that's a, a, a big part of the conventional product. And because we're going to talk about FHA loan mortgage insurance in just a second, but having that feature is really, really important, especially for some of our buyers that purchased two years ago and their rates are at 3%. Um, they wouldn't want to be in a refinance situation with rates at 6% to try to get out of their mortgage insurance. So having that cancellation option is a big part of being able to take advantage of a conventional loan. Now, if we were to look at the payment scenario, and I know this loan amount's a little bit low for us in the Orange County market, but let's say, I finance $450,000 and I have a credit score of 740 and I'm putting a minimum down of 3%. My PMI cost is going to be about $183 a month in that scenario. Okay. Um, so if you look at your, you know, calculators on uh, Redfin or Zillow, uh, you know, a lot of those are going to have much higher calculations for the MI because they're not, they're not aggregated for um, or calibrated for the different characteristics that make up a PMI cost. So the question came in, um, came in, okay. So a question came in about conventional loans. Do you finance from a bank or some other agency? So good question. I think it's something we don't really talk too much in our, in our classes, but so as American Pacific Mortgage, we're a mortgage banker and we're a direct lender. So when we're lending, we're lending our own funds. In the mortgage space, there's kind of three different channels you can go to as a consumer. So you can go to the traditional bank, like, you know, Wells Fargo, Chase, where you kind of have just a set product options and it's kind of like, this is what it works. This works for you. Great. If not, then maybe not. There's um, the other side of it, which would be a mortgage broker and a mortgage broker charges a fee for act, getting access to funds. And then kind of right in the middle is what we call as a mortgage banker. So we lend our own funds. We make our own credit decisions. And generally we're selling loans directly to Fannie Mae and uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, as well as FHA. And of course there's VA loans. We would, we would, um, Depends on the, the servicer that we will elect for something like that. Okay. All right. Great questions tonight, guys. All right. Let's 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 talk now about FHA loans. So FHA loans are not just for first-time buyers. They can be for second and third-time buyers. As we learned earlier, there's a minimum credit score of 580. And the mortgage insurance is a bit different than, when a, than a conventional loan. So there's monthly MI, which is the equivalent of 0.85% of our loan amount. But there's also upfront mortgage insurance, which is 1.75% of our loan amount. And that gets added on to the total amount finance. A big component of FHA mortgage insurance is it does not have a cancellation option. So if I'm going to try to cancel FHA mortgage insurance, I actually have to refinance out of the loan. So that's 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 a big deal with FHA loans. So a lot of our clients that are electing this product may be looking at it for maybe the next two or three years. It may not be the long-term solution. 
Now, if we look at FHA mortgage insurance and, and take that same $450,000 loan amount. So I have a $450,000 loan amount here. I take my monthly PMI now with the 0.85% factor, pushes the, the monthly MI to $324 a month. But we also have the upfront mortgage insurance, which is $78.75 that gets added on top of the $450. Okay, so that's standard with FHA loans. Now, when you look at the product comparison here, you may say, well, why would I ever choose FHA? Because the conventional loan has the cancellation option as lower MI, all that seems much better. And it really just depends on our client situation, right? Um, minimum scores are lower in FHA. FHA is going to have a lot more leniency when it comes to past credit challenges, maybe a bankruptcy in the past, or maybe a past foreclosure. So as we meet with our clients for their um, home buying session and to design a home buying plan for them, it'll really just be dependent on what makes the most sense for them as a buyer. Okay. Um... So question was on the MI that came in or the MI that we used on the last slide. Um, what percentage did we use? So that, I think that was calculated at 0.37%. Okay. And that, that percentage factor will change based upon your credit score. And of course, your down payment and your mail finance, those three key characteristics. Okay. So let's talk about the documentation when it comes to qualifying for a mortgage. I kind of want to center this around the income documentation. Um, usually if you're a W-2 employee, we're going to look at the last two years of um, W-2s, tax returns. Um, and then we'll want to see the last 30 days of pay stubs. Okay. And usually we have to do some type of written verification, or, sorry, a, a verbal and or written employment verification. Um, and we want to be able to um, review the last two years of work history and or education. So if I'm newly graduated and um, let's say I just started my, my career and I, um, uh, you know, I'm maybe a month on the job, as long as I can show that I have education in my line of work right now. So let's say, for example, I graduated from UCI with a four-year degree in accounting and I just got hired on to Deloitte. As long as I can show my educational history, and I, even though I have new employment, that still makes up the full two-year history that we would need for qualifying. And I'll give you guys a couple other scenarios in just a second, but let's now let's talk a little bit about self-employed clients. So the documentation is going to be a little more intensive because we will need for certain the last two years tax returns. Depends on how the business is structured. We'll ask for certain types of, of business returns. If it's a corp, we'll have to ask for the corporate two-year returns and probably K-1s. So there's a little bit more that goes into um, qualifying for our self-employed self -employed clients. Um, we'll usually ask for a P&L statement, so profit and loss statement and a balance sheet. We'll also verify the employment online uh, or the, the business online, as well as through like a business license or maybe even a CPA letter, which, whichever is easier for a client. Now, a couple of rules on lending is pretty important in income because uh, or qualifying for the income uh, on a mortgage. Um, if you have dual employment, so let's say you're in the healthcare industry and you work for one clinic here and you have another clinic that you work for and they're both 30 hour work week jobs, you do have to show that you're simultaneously working both jobs for two years um, consistently. OK, so that's that's a big part of showing dual employment. Um, if you're working 40 hours a work week, but you're also maybe doing Uber on the side or, you know, DoorDash, for example, um, you do have to show that you've been doing both the self-employment as well as the W-2 employment simultaneously for two years. Okay. Now, if you're transitioning employment, so let's say I've been on my job for five years and I have a job offer to go work for another company. And all I have is an executed offer letter that shows going to that's going to show my future pay. We can still pre-approve you based upon that executed offer letter. Okay, so that's that's an option too to think about as a buyer. So if I know I'm going to make eighty thousand dollars a year in my future job, and I'm going to start there in thirty days, I can still go through the mortgage qualifying process as long as I have an executed offer letter, so we know kind of what we're going to be making. Um, all right, so. Question came in about, does having an S-Corp versus an LLC affect the credit underwriting? So it doesn't affect the underwriting. We'll just, there's a different calculation that we use for each business because there's different things with on, within the tax return that we're going to look at uh, on an S-Corp versus an LLC when we kind of calculate out the net income. So Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac have a kind of a standard calculation. All right. We got a great group tonight. We got some pretty detailed out questions. So I really appreciate you guys uh, giving us some feedback and, and sharing that on air with us. 
Okay, I want to stick with income, and we're going to talk a little bit about debt to income ratio. So, debt to income ratio is your gross monthly income versus your monthly obligations, credit cards, personal loans, student loans, um, anything like that that we're going to have obligation to. So, we take the gross monthly income versus those obligations, and it creates this percentage. Usually, that debt to income ratio can't be higher than 45%. On conforming limit loans, in some cases, you can get as high as 50%. Jumbo loans, the maximum debt to income ratio is 43%. Okay. Um, and, you know, when we think about debt to income ratio, it's not going to be necessarily an indicator of affordability. It's going to be more so around do I qualify? So, as we meet with you for your consultation, we really want to understand what affordability looks like. Okay. Because that's what's going to be most important for you to create sustainable home ownership for you. All right. Um, question came in. Let me just read this really quick. So question was, um, does is it just the gross income that plays a factor in the qualifying or is it the take home as well? So we, we only look at gross monthly income. The only time we'll look at your net income is if there's some deductions that, you know, if, if someone had um, a deduction for like a child support deduction or whatever, we would have to understand, you know, what that monthly obligation is because that would have to get factored into the debt to income ratio. But if you're deducting money and going into a savings account or you're doing after tax contributions to whatever that might be, that doesn't impact your your um, your qualifying income. Um, if you're if you have a 401k loan, sometimes we see that that doesn't impact your qualifying at all because that'll come out of your after tax numbers. So here's the calculation for debt to income ratio. Uh, so we have principal and interest, taxes, so that's property taxes, and the homeowner's insurance, plus PMI. So if we have PMI on the loan, which is private mortgage insurance, and then if I'm buying a condo, maybe a townhouse, sometimes home uh, standard single family homes will have HOAs or homeowners association dues. So if we assumed that we had a home that was $2,500 a month, and then we have other debts like our credit cards and personal loans at $500 a month, that would be a sum of $3,000. And then if I'm making $8,500 a month, real simple math is 3,000 divided by 8,500. Now my debt to income ratio is at 35.29%. Most of our first time buyers feel pretty comfortable around 33 to 36% debt to income ratio. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you can go as high as 50%, but we really got to understand what that looks like um, because we want to make sure that this is going to be sustainable home ownership for you. We want to make sure we're not just trying to meet the qualifying parameters. So we had a question that came in on debt to income ratio. And that question is for debt to income ratio, if there's a co-borrower and one person has a higher ratio than the other, and the other has a lower ratio, which one is more weighted? So the way debt to income ratio works is if we're going to apply jointly. So if you and a partner are going to apply together, we combine both the income and the obligations for basically one debt to income ratio. So we don't have set separate debt to income ratios for each borrowers. Okay. All right. Great question. Okay, so the last component of building our home buying plan is going to be down payment. And so we're going to be looking at assets for our down payment, our closing costs. We talked a little bit about reserves. Um, these are some of the acceptable sources for down payment. So checking in savings accounts, we'll generally want to see the last two months of statements. So if we have any cash deposits, unfortunately, we're not going to be able to use those because Everything has to be paper trailed within the home buying process. Now, if you've had a large deposit and it was a bonus uh, from your payroll, that's pretty easy to, to track. Or maybe you're going to get a tax refund in February. All that stuff can be traced, but cash deposits make it a little bit difficult uh, on the financing side. So everything has to be paper trailed. Retirement accounts can potentially be used. So I talked a little bit about 401k loans. Um, you can take a 401k loan out. Um, if you do that, you're taking money out, of, you're borrowing against your own asset. We do not um, have that 401k payment penalize you in terms of the obligations for your debt to income ratio, but you really want to talk to your financial advisor, see if that's a good move for you or not. 403b is the same thing. And then IRAs work a little bit different. You'd have to liquidate the asset. Uh, again, I encourage you to talk to your financial advisor and your tax advisor, perhaps on something like that. And gift funds can also be allowed. Um, gift funds do not require any seasoning. So most assets require 60 days of seasoning, but but gift funds do not. Um, generally, that's where a family member is, is helping you out with your home purchase. 
Um, those funds have to be paper trailed, usually in the form of a gift letter. We'll have to see the transfer of the funds into your account. Sometimes it makes more sense for the donor to send the money straight to escrow. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that in just a second. Um, but at the end of the day, we just, we just have to trace where those funds are coming from. Okay. Now, when we think about home ownership, and I always tell our, our group as I teach these classes, there's kind of usually two things that can be hurdles for our first time buyers. It can be maybe challenges with credit because maybe just we're a little overextended or maybe our credit score is not where it needs to be. But probably the biggest challenge we see is just around just to having enough savings to meet maybe the down payment and closing cost requirements for your home purchase. And we understand, you know, that can be a bit of a, you know, a difficult thing, right, for home ownership. So in thinking more about how do we create more savings for ourselves and look at other resources, there's some fantastic resources available through Cal HFA, which is the California Housing Finance Agency, designed to help first-time home buyers that are purchasing using conventional and or FHA loans. Um, and there's some fantastic things that are kind of on the horizon with Cal HFA, which we're going to talk about in just a minute. Um, today, there's the My Home and Zip Assistance Program. The My Home product provides up to 3% of your sales price in assistance, so it can meet that full uh, conventional minimum down payment amount. And then for an FHA loan, you can get up to 3.5%, which can cover the full down payment for an FHA loan. So in that type of scenario, you could only have to maybe put your closing costs out of pocket. And we're going to show uh, an example to you in just a minute. Um, now, the program that we're really excited about that's supposed to launch early Q1 of 2023 is called the California Dream for All program. And this program provides up to 20% in assistance for a future first-time home buyer. So if you think about 20% down payment, that could potentially put you in a position where you eliminate mortgage insurance, you reduce your total amount finance, and so it creates a much higher level of affordability for our buyers. Now, there is an equity share component to this, um, which means is as my home appreciates over time, so let's say I'm in my home for seven years and my home goes up $100,000 in value, then potentially I'd be paying back the 20% that I got from us in the assistance, but then I would also be paying 20% of my equity that's grown over the course of time. Now, I understand that's a trade-off and you know having to, to give up some of your equity, but at the same time, for many of our first-time home buyers, having the opportunity to be able to put 20% down is an incredible, incredible resource for us. So the product has not been fully designed yet. So I'm kind of maybe speaking or teaching from a high-level perspective right now, but we'll be sharing more details on that program as it gets released. We, we happen to be the number one partner with Cal HFA. So I get I'm very fortunate to be on the project team for Cal HFA. And you're going to get the latest details from us as we get them. So, you know, I encourage you if you do like that product. Um, or want to know more, follow us on our social channels because um, we're going to be posting updates as we receive those. Okay. Um, all right. So question came in and I'm going to go over some of the more about the program here. Can someone use an after-tax brokerage account as a paper trail for the down payment? Absolutely. Yeah. So brokerage accounts are absolutely allowed. We just have to paper trail, you know, maybe the sale of the asset or if the asset's already in a cash position, we have to just see those monies being transferred. Okay. So one of the cool things about Cal HFA, it's not only that it helps first-time homebuyers create sustainable and affordable homeownership, but it also has very uh, lenient income limits. So most of the income limits are 150% of the median income. So in Orange County, we can go up to a loan or a, sorry, an income of 235,000, LA is 180. And these income limits get updated every June throughout the year. So in June of 2023, we'll probably see another level of income given the cost of living in the California markets. Um, now, there is low-income products as well offered through Cal HFA, and those are for our clients that make less than 80% of the median income. So I, I believe like in LA County, it's like 72000 and I think it's uh, 78000 in the Orange County markets. Um, let me show you an example of what Cal HFA can do for a conventional home buyer. Okay, so let's say I'm going to buy a $500,000 house just to make the math really easy for us. The minimum down payment is 3%, which is $15,000. Now we also have closing costs, which can be anywhere between $10,000 to $15,000. So I always kind of estimate it 2 to 3% of your sales price. That can certainly change. But I'm probably going to need about twenty-five to thirty thousand out of pocket to buy that five hundred thousand dollar house, and that can be a bit of a stretch for some of our first-time buyers. Um, and so, if we were to incorporate Cal HFA assistance, the My Home, 
that my home right here would provide $15,000 to offset the down payment requirement. And then as a first time home buyer, all I'm gonna be expected to get out of pocket is just my closing costs, that 10 to 15,000. Now there is an add-on that's that's available now on the market because we've seen interest rates improve and that's this zip assistance here. And the zip assistance um, allows a first time buyer to get an additional two to 3% of their loan amount in zero interest assistance. Now you have to take first the My Home Assistance and utilize that product, and then you can add on the Zip Assistance if you need more more help. But I will say, if you do incorporate the Zip Assistance, it elevates the interest rate pretty significantly. So today the interest rates were right around the six point one two five mark for just the My Home Assistance first mortgage. If you added the Zip Assistance, it'll elevate you in probably to the seven percent range. So we have to kind of see if that really makes sense for you as a first time buyer. But the Cali HFA interest rate schedules are, are very competitive. Um, and, and speaking of that, the FHA loan today, that rate was at 5.625. Um, and the FHA program works similarly to the conventional loan. So we still look at that minimum down payment of three, three and a half percent. The My Home Assistance would help um, provide $17,500 in support for down payment. And then, like I said earlier, a buyer would just have to worry about the closing costs out of pocket. Here's some of the eligibility requirements for the Cal HFA loan. So it's a minimum credit score of 640 for the FHA loan, 680 for a conventional loan. Um, now, um, the Cal HFA product does allow debt to income ratios to go as high as 50%, um, but the max generally is, is 45%. Okay. Um, and then we have the income qualifications, like we saw earlier, they're going to be based upon the applicant income, not the household size. So most first time buyer programs are going to be based upon um, what the entire household income is making, where the first time buyer program with Cali TV just looks at the applicant. Here's why that's important, because if I'm making $150,000 a year and I really want to buy in LA County and my spouse is making $50,000. Now combined, we make 200,000, which would be too much for LA County. However, if I apply just in my name, then my 150 would be within the income limits for Cal HFA LA County. So that's a really cool opportunity there. Now, another thing with first-time buyers, a first-time buyer is someone that hasn't owned in the last three years. So if I owned back in 2015, sold my home, and I've been renting ever since, I'm still considered a first-time buyer. And this program works for single family homes, condos, townhouses, um, some of the uh, BMR properties, which are below market programs, um, can also work with this as well. Manufactured homes can be a little more challenging because um, you have to be on the, uh, the property has to be on land that's owned. It can't be like a manufactured home in a park. Okay, so before we get into the uh, process now, I'm going to kind of just answer a few questions. So a question was, you know, what's the ideal interest rate for me to be thinking about buying a house as a first time buyer? That's really going to be something that's going to be interpretive for, for you as a first-time buyer when it comes to budget, right? So we'll have to kind of sit down and figure out based upon where interest rates are at today, you know, is it is a market affordable for you? And that's what we can help out through a home buying plan. So I'd really encourage you with that question to maybe sit down with us for a consultation uh, to see what your options look like. Um, you know, we can look at today's interest rates and of course, maybe forecast where, you know, what interest rates or where interest rates are going uh, to give you an idea. But, you know, I think for us, as we're building plans to think about interest rates getting back to the 3% or even 4% level is probably unrealistic. I think as we're thinking forward in home buying, you know, we're going to at least be in the 5% levels. Um, and then so a question was, what does it mean to be manually underwritten and how to decide whether to pursue this route or not? So a manual underwrite is something where um, an underwriter um, goes through and, you know, underwrites the loan, but has to hit certain criteria. The manual underwrite is, is maybe 1% of loans out there. It doesn't happen a lot. It's usually for past challenges. So if someone has maybe a bankruptcy and there's an exception that we need to make, or maybe some late payments, um, usually we see those on FHA loans, but they become much more restrictive in terms of debt to income ratio. I, I believe it's a maximum debt to income ratio of like 36% on manually underwritten loans. So generally we would do a manual underwritten loan if there was some type of qualifying challenge. Most loans are going to be going through an automated underwriting system. So for Fannie Mae, it's called desktop underwriting or DU. Uh, for Freddie Mac loans, it's going to be LP or what we call loan prospector. 
Okay, let's talk a little bit about the steps of home buying. So now that we've learned all this, hopefully great information for you around product, interest rate, the market, income. Now let's kind of look at the, the six steps of home buying. Um, and so the first step on this journey towards home ownership is going to be kind of the output of a consultation with us, and that's the pre-approval. So a pre-approval states that you are eligible as a buyer. So your financing has been all confirmed. So your, your sales price, your loan amount, your down payment, your projected interest rate is all noted in within your pre-approval. Usually the pre-approval is going to be good for 60 days. Now, there is another thing called a pre-qualification. We don't do pre-qualifications because honestly, they don't hold, hold up in today's market. A pre-qualification is only where someone has looked at your credit and deemed you eligible for financing where a pre-approval is taken into consideration income, assets, credit, uh, and of course, completed a full consultation with you. Now, after we've been pre-approved, now we have a certificate and that certificate allows us to make offers on homes. But before we do that, we wanna kind of see what's out in the market, right? So generally you're gonna partner with a realtor. Uh, we have a fantastic network of realtors across, we call them preferred realtors across the, the markets, but a realtor will help kind of get you set up on an online search, also kind of take you to properties uh, that maybe fit your criteria and also help negotiate and make offers on homes for you. Usually once you've made an offer on a house, we'll update a pre-approval to match the offer price that you're going to make on a house. Um, and, you know, with the house hunting, that's probably the most exciting, but also probably nerve wracking stage of the process because you're really trying to find that right house. What's, you know, in today's market right now with limited inventory, there's only certain options out there, but those buyers that are out in the market are really seeing a, a much different landscape where they're not having the competitiveness that we once saw, you know, you know, three to six months down, you know, down uh, uh, three to six months ago in, in 2022. Okay, I'm going to answer this question really quick and I'll kind of keep us on track with the, the six steps of home buying here. So a question came in, if I was added to my parents' property, I never haven't made the mortgage payment, but we own the home, would I not be considered a first time home buyer because of that? So Denise, the, 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 the follow-up question for you on that is if you're on your parents' house, but have you been living there in the last three years? So you could be on the deed to the house, but if you haven't lived there for the last three years, then you would still be considered a first-time buyer. Okay. All right. So let's kind of fast forward through the six steps of home buying. So now we found our house. We want to make an offer. And guess what? That offer gets accepted. We're all super excited. Um, our team's going to reach out to you and say, congratulations, uh, because now you've had that accepted offer and we're going to enter the escrow process. The escrow time period is on standard, usually 30 days, especially during the holiday season. It's usually 30 days. But as we get into the spring and summer months, it gets a little more competitive. The, those, closing, uh, those escrow time periods can be as short as 21 days. Now, when the seller has accepted your offer, that's day one of the escrow time period. And usually at day one, you're going to have two to three days to get your what we call an earnest money deposit deposited into the escrow account. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about earnest money deposits in just a second. Now, as soon as we get the accepted offer, our team's going to reach out to you over the phone, congratulate you, talk a little bit about your offer. Um, and then we're going to review some next step items, including getting you scheduled for your follow-up consultation. And we usually do that within two to three days after we have your financing all set up. And we meet up with you for video, a video consultation just to make sure you understand your timelines, your financing options, your out-of-pocket expenses. And then we'll kind of talk a little bit about strategy around interest rates. Um, also, what happens at day one is your inspections are ordered by your realtor, your appraisal gets ordered by our team. And within about 72 hours of that follow-up consultation, you're going to have disclosure sent to you for e-signature. And those should be all kind of in sync with what we saw during your follow-up consultation. Now, I mentioned to you a little bit about earnest money deposits. And what that is, that's a deposit that you make that's equivalent of 1% to 2% of your sales price. And that deposit is a good faith deposit. Sometimes it can be a little bit more, especially in our higher priced homes. And if we're maybe looking at homes in the Bay Area, for example, and up here in Northern California, sometimes that deposit can be as high as 3%. But that money is held in escrow while you go through what we call the contingency period. The contingencies allow you to do your due diligence on the house. When I think back six months ago in the market, contingencies were almost tough to get with sellers because sellers kind of had the upper hand, right? Um, they were able to say, hey, I have, 20 other people that want this house. So you're not going to get the extra time to do your due diligence on the house. And now since we're, the market is normalizing a bit, now you as a buyer can take that time, which is usually 14 to 17 days to get your appraisal done on your house, get your home inspected, 
Uh, make sure you understand there's any type of potential pitfalls uh, with this property. And then, of course, get your loan approved. So those contingencies usually are in the first 14 to 17 days of your contract. Okay. Um, so um, when we think about the contingency period, the contingency period is going to protect you as a buyer to ensure that you've kind of done all your homework. And so you can confidently move forward in your home purchase without any type of reservations on, is this kind of the right move for me, right? Um, step four is gonna be the processing and underwriting of the loan. That's where we're doing the administrative task. Um, we're gonna have your rate locked in probably by that time, depending on where the market's at and what you agree to, to have us do. Uh, we're gonna verify your employment, your assets, and then we're gonna move on down the line to the underwriting review. And our underwriting is going to issue a loan approval for you. Um, usually that's going to be uh, within probably four to five days of your accepted offer. Sometimes it can be a little bit longer depending on the complexities of the financing. Um, and then along the kind of the path of homeownership. So at these different milestones, you're going to get disclosure sent to you. So you get initial disclosure sent to you. Once we lock in your interest rate, you get a redisclosure. And then at step five, we send a final closing disclosure. And that gives you a three-day cooling off period before we get to the very final stage, which is called step six in the process. Now at step five, you're probably also at the end of your contingency period. So if you feel comfortable with the outcome of your inspections, your appraisal is checked out okay, and of course you have your loan approval, then you can sign off on your contingency. And when you do that, that basically tells the seller that you're ready to go to the final stages and you feel comfortable with all the homework you've done on the property. The very final stage is closing the loan, and that happens after the cooling off period. That's when we sign final documents on the property. Those are done in person with the public notary. And tonight we had several clients actually signing final documents uh, with their mobile notary tonight. Um, usually because of the COVID protocol, they're not done at the escrow company like they were back in the days. So they're usually done with a mobile notary, maybe at, at the buyer's house. Um, after that happens, the next business day, our buyers are going to wire in their funds that are still owed in the transaction. Those monies get reconciled by the escrow company. And then the next day, we're going to do a final audit of the client's loan and then wire in the mortgage funds. So that money gets all collected by the escrow company. And they basically make sure that you as a buyer have contributed the funds you're supposed to get. And then they balance that out with what the seller is supposed to receive in sales proceeds. Once that's all occurred, then the escrow officer will go ahead and transfer recordable documents to the county recorder. They'll record a grant deed that transfers ownership to you. And they also record a deed of trust, which is your agreement to repay the loan. And so once all that gets confirmed with the county recorder's office, guess what? Now you become the official owner of the home and we get a chance to high five and celebrate. The first thing I'm going to do is give you a call and say congratulations because you have made it through this, this journey. And that journey you know, doesn't come with out stress and anxiety. We understand all that, but we try to be here and be supportive for you during that process. Okay. So we had some questions before we uh, go into the next uh, topic here. I want to answer some of these questions. You guys are lots of questions tonight, which I love. Um, first question was who sets up an escrow account to receive the earnest money? So that will generally be done by the buyer and the seller's agent. So that um, they deem an escrow company that's going to be used and then that escrow company will reach out to you with wire instructions uh, to make your deposit. Um, next question, have you ever encountered cases where the actual underwriting ended up much different than the pre-approval in that case? How does the buyer back out of the process? So um, it, there shouldn't be any surprises when we go into underwriting um, unless the underwriter discovers something we didn't see at the upfront stages. Um, you know, the underwriter may calculate maybe income differently or maybe finds an obligation that we didn't see at pre-approval. Um, but as soon as we are aware of that with our underwriting team, that's the first we're going to be calling you first to kind of understand that and try to find different uh, solutions or workarounds. Um, so would it be at all possible to complete the home buying process without a realtor to save on fees? Well, Absolutely, yes. Um, but at the same time, realtors are paid for by the seller. So I think in this market that has more normalized, I would take advantage of the resource. Um, there's different approaches. Some people think, hey, if I go to the realtor, I'm going to be able to negotiate a better price. I think buyers have the upper hand right now. So I don't think you need to go there. I think it's more important to have that resource available to help you out with negotiations, give you that comfort and support and make sure from just an overall like legal perspective that you really understand what you're you're signing up for in your purchase contract. Okay, last question um, before we move on uh, was for these steps, what is the minimum amount of days, months you should expect to close? Um, so like I mentioned earlier, from step three to step six, it's usually about 30 days for the process. 
Now, probably the longest step in the process is from pre-approval to accepted offer. And that can range. I have some clients, it's three weeks, sometimes it's three months, sometimes it's three years. So it really just depends on if you really want to be in a certain location, you really want this particular area, or you're open to anything, um, you know, and you have some flexibility that could change the time that you know, it takes to find the right house for you. So now that you've learned a little bit about the six steps of home buying, and if that's something that's interesting to you and you want to kind of set up a consultation to do a home buying plan, really super simple. There's an easy online application. We only start with a soft credit check. You'll upload some documents to your online app, and then we'll schedule your video consultation. So it's really super easy. That's a one-on-one -on -one we usually will do with me. Uh, it's about a 30-minute session. Um, now, after today's workshop, if you just want to maybe have some follow-up questions that you want to go through, we can do introductory calls with our team um, to answer maybe credit questions or savings questions, maybe more questions around the process. And the links to set up any one of those calls are all here on this slide. Okay, here's what the, the consultation looks like. Pretty simple. We're going to talk about you know where we're looking to buy because that's going to drive some of our sales prices. We're going to talk more about the six steps of home buying, budgeting, credit, uh, maybe some possible solutions to, to maybe get us closer to home ownership. Uh, maybe we need to do some credit strategy, maybe a saving strategy. So we'll kind of talk about all those things during that free consultation for you. Um, now, our mobile app is a, a fantastic resource for you, and the link's right here to be able to download for Android or Apple. You can start the process right through mobile, so that's pretty cool, and then you can even upload documents through our scan function within the mobile app. Um, as I mentioned earlier, as we launched in tonight's discussion, really super proud of our UCI partnership that we've had over the last four or five years, and we provide a discount for that partnership for anybody that's going to complete their financing with us. And we're also proud of our other partnerships too. We've really grown our network of alumni between UC Riverside on, you know, USC, Long Beach State. We also go as far as University of Maryland and University of Virginia on the East Coast. So we're really kind of expanding our network because we love teaching these classes through our educational platform and giving back to our communities on what home ownership could be like for you. So, you know, whether you're looking to buy in 2023 or 2026, we want to make sure that you have all the tools and resources to make a great financial decision for your futures. Again, these free consultations that we do as a follow-up to tonight's class are something that I really encourage you to take advantage of so you can build your own home buying plan. Here's all my contact information. So, you know, if you want to message me after tonight's class, feel free. Um, as I mentioned, we're going to be posting up updates with our different products that are rolling out, especially the California Dream product. So if you're interested in that, follow us on our social. Uh, Jay made a mortgage on Instagram. And we love what our clients say about us. You know, if you look at some of our Google reviews, Yelp reviews, a lot of those reviews are from class uh, classes that we've had over the last seven, eight years, uh, graduates that took on home ownership and uh, really uh, excited and really um thrilled about their experience with our team here. So really proud of what, what our clients are saying about us there. Um, so with that said, that brings us to the end of tonight's class. I'm We've had a lot of questions, probably one of our uh, most questions we've had in our classes in the last couple of weeks. So I really appreciate that. I'm gonna answer some more questions on air so you can throw some um, other questions out at me. I have one that just came in and then we'll kind of put a, put a wrap on it tonight. So, um, so question was, sorry, I missed this part, but how does a bank play into the six steps of home buying process? So a bank, as it relates to the lending side, would have a, a, a little bit of a different process. So again, as I maybe mentioned earlier, so we're a mortgage banker, so we have kind of a very meticulous process and how we move the clients through it. I will have to say, you know, we kind of have more of a high touch process, you know, having interactive with clients over text, over through our mobile app. You know, making sure that we're very supportive as we move through those six steps of home buying. We have uh, email updates that go out as each client hits those milestones. So I couldn't really give you much perspective on how a bank, you know, uh, takes a client through the process. I just know kind of we try to make it really a high touch experience. Okay. Any other questions out there? I, I we did a, I think a pretty good job of answering those questions through most of tonight's class. But certainly, if we missed anything, we'd love to be able to cover them here with you now. So the question is, uh, what can we do as an individual straight out of college to prepare to get our best loans uh, for financing? So I think, you know, you know, taking those next steps of building a home buying plan and having someone assess your credit, seeing, you know, seeing where you're at asset wise to 
figure out, you know, what our savings goal looks like and ultimately kind of designing a home buying budget. Um, so whether that's a, a 2023 goal, like I said, or maybe something that's down the road for you, I think getting connected with us for a one-on-one -on -one to develop a plan, I think is a fantastic thing. I mean, I meet with clients that are two to three years out um, after they've taken these classes. So there isn't a, a straight timeline of come to a class, go get pre-approved, go find a house. It's more of, hey, learn a little bit more about home ownership. If it's something you think is in your financial futures, get connected with us, figure out what a plan looks like, and then we kind of move forward from there. I think a question came in about, are these slides going to be available? So yeah, so we're going to send all of our slides out tomorrow morning. Uh, you'll have all your calculators, everything that you need there. Um, we'll make sure that's all provided. Okay. All right, perfect. All right, well, thank you so much for joining tonight's class. Um, it was great seeing everyone. Um, hopefully you enjoyed this content and uh, I wish everybody a wonderful, safe and happy holiday season. Uh, we look forward to meeting up with you, hopefully for a consultation or intro call soon. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.